Um, so I am Amy. I am the Blind Button Masher. Um, you can there's my Twitter handle there at Blonde Historian. Um, so a uh, little description about about me. So I was born visually impaired. There's some super cute baby photos of me. Um, I have a condition called ocular albinism. So actually, Steve and I have very comparable vision. Um, so there's some cute photos of here of me with my adorable squint. And then me and my sister on our laptop fighting over again. When I was about nine years old, um, I went to my eye doctor and they recommended to my parents that I should play video games to help my vision focus and to improve my hand-eye coordination. So I am probably one of the only uh, kids ever to be told by a doctor to play video games. Um, and, you know, I, I grew my passion from there. I was very lucky to have a nice babysitter who was a teenage boy called Tim who uh, was quite happy to show me Tomb Raider and printed off um, cheat sheets from web forums in the 90s, which for you kids out there will be, you know, your YouTube walkthroughs. We used to have to print things off and read it out. Um, so I've always enjoyed gaming ever since I was a kid, but, um, you know, being an impoverished student meant that I kind of drifted out of gaming until I met my lovely partner, who is known on the internet as Other Half. Here is a rare sighting of Other Half. Um, and he really got me back into gaming uh, because Other Half has a chronic inability to finish any game. And so when he, you know, got halfway through Assassin's Creed or halfway through the Tomb Raider franchise, I ended up starting to finish games for him. And it became a really positive experience for me because especially at the time that my partner got me back into gaming, um, I was finishing my PhD um, and I had very bad anxiety and depression. So I could motivate myself through my real life grind by rewarding myself at the end of the day with a video game. Um, on an adventure with Lara or Geralt or Nathan Drake, you know, my mind was occupied and it really helped me with my mental health. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the kind of games that I enjoy. Um, there's a little photo of my setup here, um, which I am sat at right now. Um, as you can see, I've got my little computer monitor. I have finally sorted my Twitch properly now. In some of the video clips that you're going to see, there's like a mix of me streaming from console, not streaming at all. Um, but now, you know, I've got the webcam and everything sorted, so you can come and come and hang out. Um, I have a big 48-inch 40, TV. Um, and that actually photo there, it's sat quite far back on the desk. Sometimes that TV is like right on the lip, the edge of the desk. Um, playing games sometimes you know my nose bumps into the screen because of my low vision uh, I do have residual vision I can see some details up close but there are days where I have very little vision if I'm stressed or tired and I can't really see anything at all um, I'm a casual hobby gamer I probably play um, maybe one or two evenings a week sometimes with friends and I play on the weekend um, we are a more consoles than people household. Uh, my weapon of choice is the PS4, um, but we also have an Xbox, we have a gaming PC and we have a Switch. Uh, I tend to play most kind of big blockbuster games that I can access and a few more kind of niche specialist things. Um, and my interest in gaming accessibility has grown over the past couple of years. Um, you know, following Steve, other advocates, I've started talking a little bit more about game accessibility as part of my other activism and consulting on a few projects uh, like with Ubisoft recently. Um, and now I give talks about gaming, which I enjoy very much. Um, so what kind of games do I like? Um, my vision does limit the type of games that I can play, or at least the games that are accessible for me to play. So um, I'm just going to demonstrate to you using a little clip from State of Decay. 
Um, maybe why I don't tend to do driving games very much. So this clip shows me as the character getting into a car and then repeatedly reversing it into a tree. And uh, I kind of, I'm commenting, it's a bit quiet on the video, I apologize, but I'm kind of nattering on about being a blind driver and not really ever having driven a real car. So I'm not very good at it. So here I go, there's my character. And I get in the car. Now, my other half and I co-play this game quite a lot. And you'll see shortly why I'm not allowed to drive in the game. So I just repeatedly reverse into the car, zombie climbs on the car. I kill the zombie, just keep revert, keep, keep driving into the car. Then I reverse into another tree. So yeah, I'm not great at driving. So what games do I like when I'm not driving cars into trees? I like a third person action adventure game. I enjoy great narrative, complex characters, smattering of puzzles, and a little bit of combat. I enjoy the influence of RPG and open world on the action and adventure genre. Um, so a lot of the games I've played recently, uh, the two Raider reboots, Assassins, Horizon Zero Dawn, The Last of Us, uh, that kind of game are my, are my favourites. But you know, I dabble, I enjoy a bit of Minecraft, oh, I have a go at things like Fall Guys, but my passion is more for those kind of action and adventure third person games. So today I'm going to focus on two key accessibility issues that affect gaming for me as a low vision player. Um, there are lots of other important aspects and I hope they'll be covered the rest of today. Things like puzzle skips. Um, actually, as a low vision player, they can be fantastic. That's not just a fine motor um, accessibility uh, function. Um, so the two areas I really want to explore today are navigation and gameplay. Uh, just up on the screen, we've got a little picture of one of my Twitch emotes. That is my white cane button mashing, blind button masher, that's me. Now, obviously it kind of goes without saying that I am gonna heap praise on The Last of Us 2. I am ramping with my Firefly t-shirt, as you can see. Um, for me personally, it hit pretty much every single access point that I needed. But I think it's important to note that it's not the only way to do things right. And actually, there were others that have done interesting things beforehand that I think are worth reflecting on. But there are two key things that I just think should be default. And if there are game devs watching, these are the two things you have no excuse not to do. I don't, I don't care. I'm not going to listen if you say there's an excuse, because there's no excuse. Number one, screen readers. There's no excuse for not having a screen reader. They have existed since the 1980s. Get on board with it. It's not hard. And they make such a difference for so many people. And secondly, have user interface settings for bigger text. You're already designing the text. Give us different colors, give us different sizes. If that's the minimum you can do. You will make dozens, hundreds, thousands more games more accessible to players like me. Okay, so let's get into it. Number one, maps and menus. One of the biggest challenges I have as a player is teeny tiny text on complicated and cluttered menus and maps. The slides here are just cycling through a few examples from Tomb Raider, from Assassin's Creed of different maps and menus. It's a real challenge navigating these and there is nothing more frustrating or boring than repeatedly having to call, call in your partner or get a sighted person on Discord to read a menu to you, especially when you're in the middle of a bit of combat or you quickly need to, I don't know, brew a potion or whatever you're doing. Think about high contrast and think about text size. Next, scenery and lighting. So obviously, there's a huge passion at the moment for cinematic games, really beautiful lighting and scenery. And yes, you can auto adjust brightness, but this doesn't resolve issues with contrast or even just the general palette of a game. 
And again, not having choice over things like weather, contrast or game palette can be really limiting. There's two uh, images there. The first one was from Horizon Zero Dawn. I think we'll be able to go back to that. No. So that's Horizon Zero Dawn. It's a lovely, beautiful light shadow, but it makes the rest of the game really difficult to see. And then here we have uh, one of the Uncharted games um, where everything is grey. The world is grey. Everyone is grey. The gun is grey. The walls are grey. The man is grey. It's all grey um, and very difficult to see. Although I think I have just headshotted him. So, you know, well done me. The next thing that I'd like to talk about is wayfinding. Now, this is related to maps because if the map is too small and then your wayfinding mechanism is too complicated, I spend hours lost in games. I have to watch playthroughs, not because I cannot play the game that I'm not competent enough, but because I cannot find my way around your game. And unfortunately, this is where I'm going to talk about the first kind of bad and ironically ugly uh, game uh, is the Ghost of Tsushima. So here is a clip of me wandering around doing what I called following the farts. So the wayfinding mechanism in Ghost of Tsushima was this very beautiful wind that kind of drifted in the direction that you were supposed to go but it was really difficult to see. The other thing that it did is it would have many visual based missions. So these visual based missions, for example, the one that I'm on now, I'm supposed to be looking for some purple flowers, but the unpredictable weather and the poor wayfinding mechanism means that I, this, this, is, this is a short clip of probably what was 10, 15 minutes of just running around. And yes, I shot a deer. I took out my frustration on the deer um and it just means that you're constantly lost in this game if you're a low vision player there is an indicator symbol but as you've just seen it pops up and off the screen so it's there and then it's gone and then it's there and then it's gone it means it's really difficult to find your objective and then here we have the bird coming in this yellow bird was not my friend He'd pop up, he'd sing, he'd flap away. Yeah, he was bright. And sometimes I could listen to him. But most of the time, he doesn't take you to the objective. He takes you to an interesting thing that isn't your objective, <laughs> which meant I would get turned around and have to start the whole process again. So finally, I find the sodding purple flowers. So what games get this right? Well, there's some really fun ways of thinking about wayfinding, navigating on maps. With wayfinding, there's a really funny, sweet, cute thing that Red Dead Redemption 2 did, is they often had NPCs giving you directions. They'd come and sit in your little car and they'd go, oh, you know, Arthur, it's next on the left. And you'd be like, oh, great, thanks. Now I know where I'm going. Assassin's Creed does this really well. It combines a panable, zoomable map with different gradiated levels of detail. You've got your autopilot horse, as I call it, where you can just set your horse where to go. And then you've got the tracking that stays with you in the gameplay with big highlighted symbols. And that's a really good example. So this is my favorite example of all, which is Spider-Man. Now this video I did put captions on. I apologize that the others haven't had captions, but I was intending to talk over them. Um, but this, this, this is me excited about finding the wayfinding mechanic in Spider-Man. So this, this giant beam of light, right? That, that, ladies and gentlemen, is good sci-fi Accessibility means that I can find, okay? It's great. So I apologize now because I was very new to playing the game and I basically jump around like a very incapable person and walk into people. I haven't quite worked out the way that Spidey moved yet. My second favorite thing. So I can hear it beeping. 
there is an audio locator for the objective, which I loved in this game. Things beeped when you were near them. They were louder when you got closer to them. It was brilliant. Okay. There you go. And I found it. So solutions for thinking about how a person might navigate your game. Um, on the side here, we have a couple of my little eye twitch emotes. Aren't they cute? Come subscribe. Um, so first of all, screen reader. I'm just going to keep saying it. Screen reader, screen reader, screen reader. Have dynamic or adjustable text size and colour. It would be great to have difficulty or detail settings for wayfinding and maps. Think about that gradiated level of detail. Think about different ways of wayfinding. Could you add audio? Can NPCs help? Can you use different colours or symbols? And yes, there will always be people who want the open world challenge. You know, they want to hunt for objects, but there are people like me who need some assistance finding things. And we're going to get bored of your game if you don't put them in there. There are fun tricks that you can keep. You can have your beautiful follow the farts in Ghost of Tsushima, but if you want someone like me to enjoy your game and keep picking it up, let me change the colour of the wind. Turn the wind into an arrow. Let me fix the objective locator symbol. So next, I'm going to talk about gameplay. Unsurprisingly, I am not the most accurate shot. I often rely on melee weapons, combat, hand-to-hand, -hand, area of effect weapons. And I enjoy the crafting element of games. But this means it detracts from the gameplay. I'm going to take Horizon Zero Dawn as an example of this. Yes, I enjoyed many an hour exploring a forest to find a specific rabbit. But there were points I could not progress in the game because it relied on trick shots or it overly forced me into firefights. And I would have to spend hours crafting to get the melee and area of effect weapons or the traps just to be able to progress. So here's two examples that I think really show the impact of accessibility settings on the difference in combat. The first one is from The Last of Us 1, part 1, um, and the second one is from The Last of Us part 2, which I think really illustrates uh, the two issues. So, Last of Us part 1. It's a very dark palette to start with. And what happens is I'm perched up on a high point, I've got a bow and arrow, and I'm trying to hit zombies with the bow and arrow. I'm using the spidey sense to find where they are because that's a slightly higher contrast. But it doesn't work. I can't find them to shoot at them. This is probably like my sixth attempt at this part of the sequence. And I've realized if I go down there, I'm just gonna get eight. So, what happens is I repeatedly try to shoot the zombies and I fail. I get more and more frustrated until I'm about to give up and I think, oh, well, what is even the point? This is when gameplay isn't challenging and exciting, it's boring and frustrating. Because I know that I can beat these zombies, but I can't see them. And it's just like Steve says, I used to think I was crap at games, but what I actually needed was accessibility settings. So here I get more and more frustrated and I think, oh, well, sod it. I'm just going to go for the melee option. Bit of area of effect, I get out a Molotov. Kaboom. And that actually has the added bonus of it lights up the game. So I can then use that better light to find the enemies and the objective. And they craft another little Molotov here. And I'm going to throw it again. I'm going to get your big guy. He's at the back. Big blow to chat. So I throw that again. Light him up. I can see him again. And then I use another bomb. So like, you know, a one. I've defeated the enemies. Well, am I very satisfied with that gameplay? No, no, I'm not. Next, we have um, Last of Us 2. Now, I ended up calling this the humongous fungus, but I think apparently its, rat, its name was the Rat King. This is the big boss fight. Um, but I think humongous fungus is a better name. Um, I apologize for the swears in this bit. Um, 
when I was finding clips of me playing The Last of Us 2, made me realise I swear a lot in games, so I do apologise in advance. So you can hear me talking a little bit, mainly swearing and panicking. So, so you'll be able to hear a few things in this gameplay. You can hear the screen reader. You can see that I've got the menu set up in the way that I need. Now, unfortunately, the humongous fungus has got me there. So I say sod it, I'm putting on high contrast mode. It's too much of a challenge. I want to toggle that feature on. And all it took was a little swipe. So here we go. This is me hopefully getting towards the end of defeating the humongous fungus in high contrast mode. Instantly, it makes the area easy to navigate. You'll probably just about be able to hear some of the audio cues and the screen reader chattering away. Now this gameplay is tense. It's exciting. I'm scared of the monster. It's got me a couple of times, but I'm not feeling so defeated by it that I don't want to keep going. So here we go, mash some pipe bombs at it. There we go, boom, boom, boom. And I could avoid it there because I had the high contrast mode on so I could run past it more easily. So here we go, I keep running, keep running, and I'm thinking, oh, God, I'm never going to beat this thing, it's going to kill me again. One more quick run around, get a few bits that I can find nice and easily because they're bright yellow. So now I'm using, I'm, and also the great thing about the screen reader is when I'm stressed and my vision is all over the place because I'm scared of this big monster, the screen reader helps me select the right weapon. So now I'm really panicking because I'm like, I've run out of the flamethrower, I don't have any bombs left. What am I going to do? Last ditch attempt. So even when I'm in that stressy moment, that screen reader is really helping me. I then did a really loud and inappropriate swear, which I did not include. Um. <laughs> but that is so much more satisfying because of those accessibility settings. So now, what helps combat? Let's think about those two clips there. I don't know what the official game dev term for it is, but I call them spidey senses. So <laughs> a really frustrating thing with spidey senses, that glowing highlighting function where you click in a button and it shows you enemies or resources. Do not make it part of the skill tree. I'm going to shout out Ghost of Tsushima again that made it part of the skill tree. Do not make accessibility settings something that you have to achieve. So here's a good clip of a really good example of um, spidey sensors. I'm just going to start it and then get it to the right place because there's a, there's a jump scare which we don't need. There we go. Right, this is Tomb Raider. Lovely high contrast spidey sense. I'll get my little bugs there. Tomb Raider also used music really effectively. So when I jump down here, I can see so far into the sea. Here, clang, right, there's enemies coming. You can see so far into the screen of the high contrast resources that it makes it so easy to navigate, even in this quite dark environment. And here's me with my terrible shooting. I do not have auto aim on here. And you'll see why I need it. Hello. This is a timed button event. Hate these. Quite big, but still timed. Not great. But I'm getting eaten by these foxy world things. Eventually I'll get them. One more. And nearly. Finally. So now you'll notice that when I use the spider sense, they've changed from red, which is the enemy color, to yellow, which is the resource color. I actually think they're a really beautiful design as well. They don't jar with the rest of the scenery. They've got that nice glow on them. They're easy to find, but they're not unpleasant to look at. Next, aim assist. As you can see, girl, I need some aim assist. 
Horizon Zero Dawn had this trick shot as part of the narrative and they turned off the aim assist for the mission. And it was so frustrating and annoying. I do not want to have to get my partner into a room to come and do a trick shot for me. Don't do it. A really good game that introduced what I think is, is a pretty strong aim assist um, was Uncharted 4. And what I really want from an aim assist is the ability to, and that was the first sort of good aim assist I played, to be honest. Don't fix it. Let me flick it. <laughs> No, that sounds inappropriate. But if you have an aim assist that always sticks here, I can never get a headshot. Give me that ability to flick and move an aim assist within a limited body movement, because otherwise you are denying me that opportunity. Because what I need from an aim assist is I need to find the enemy for me, and then I want to shoot them where I want to shoot them. Next, stealth. I love me some stealth. It's my modus operandi. Stealthy games let me sneak up. They let me position myself. I can lay my traps. I can dispatch my enemy in one tap. And I don't have to rely on a panicky, frightening firefight. And this is just a stealth clip that I'm really proud of, but I think it shows the benefits of that labeling system that Assassin's Creed uses. So here I am being my girl Cassandra, and it's just a one tap, one tap, and one. he's dead. What I love about the labelling is it's, it's clear, I can see it through walls, and it's also, we have this glow on the side that is showing me an enemy proximity, I loved that feature. So I whistle this guy over, I love a whistle as well. Unfortunately, he's about to die in a really undignified way. And I can keep checking that proximity. Where are those enemies? There we go. He has quite an undignified death. His pants are on show. I apologise to him. And then I'm going to sneak up on this guy as well. And he's gone. I love a bit of stealth and I find that labelling really, really useful and clear. It makes it a lot easier to find enemies in a stealth scenario. So finally, something that I really enjoy that most people probably won't think of as an accessibility feature, but it's it's co-play. So this is the other half who you will hear shrieking in the background at me. He sat next to me as I am playing this bit of Fall Guys. So he's telling me, run right, run right, keep running right. This slime climb is hard. So now he's saying, don't jump, don't jump. I ignore him, don't jump. Oh, and I fall off, okay. So he's telling me, don't jump on those, just walk on those. Okay, do it slowly, he's saying. Oh, and I fall again. The slime is coming, be afraid. <laughs> so he's on the half likes to give me tips about how to play my games, but sometimes I don't always listen to him. Um, I want to leave time for questions, but in the next bit, I just repeatedly jump off something because I ignore him about not doing a standing jump. My other half guides me through life. You know, when I'm using my white cane, he's there to guide me. And when I'm in a game, he can guide me. And actually, we're a great team. You know, his puzzle, I've got the puzzle solving. He's got the shoot em up. He loves a first person shooter. We're a great team. But not everyone wants to play together online. Sometimes we want to play together in the same room. And I would love to think about how we can have more co-play from people who are watching my Twitch stream. You know, I can have someone chatting to me on Discord or giving me tips, but I'd I love the idea of more co-piloting and game developers thinking about how we can innovatively get that into games, into, into uh, you know, single player games as well. And I know I probably have a lot to learn on that front. So, solutions for gameplay. Make the spidey senses fixed. Don't put them in a skill tree. 
Give us high contrast options on the spidey senses for resources and enemies. Give me different color options. Give an option to highlight or tag enemies or objects permanently in the size or color that you want. When you have gameplay, why not use the puzzle skip mechanism or idea? And when you get to that mission scenario, give us an option to play it as stealth or to play it as a firefight. Have a varying difficulty of auto aim. Don't turn it off in a mission that is relying on some kind of trick shot for the narrative. If someone is using it, it's because they need it. Think about how you can use co-play for online and in-person support for gaming. Can you add a co-pilot option and even for a single player game? And don't force gameplay styles. There's nothing more frustrating than getting halfway into a game that has let you play stealthily or let you use melee options and then not being able to progress because it's relying entirely on shooting. And there's a couple more of my super cute Twitch notes there. So, in conclusion, I hope some of the points that I've discussed have helped you reflect on how you can make games more accessible to low vision players like me. But my biggest piece of advice is, of course, to involve disabled people in, your in designing accessibility settings. Now, obviously, <laughs> I didn't have my Twitch set up as good as Steve, but and we have obviously seen his viral video about this. But this is me talking and reacting to finding the accessibility settings on The Last of Us 2. And the first thing that comes up is the text to speech menu. Text to speech off enables narration of on screen text and it already puts you onto car hands. So I start crying. <laughs> text to speech, high contrast display, and half scale, large. Like I'm breathless, I can hardly it's believe it. Incredible, it's like preset, like all the things I need. Navigation, like traversal assistance, ledge guard, and the preset circle button. Uh, so we'll see how that goes because from that list, that sounds like pretty much everything I would preset, but. This is incredible, like, this is so incredible, like, look at this. To have it preset, not only to have all these options, but to have them preset. And visual aids, HUD scale, large, changes the size of the HUD element, HUD background, darkened, HUD color, white, yellow. Ah, settings on. You can have it in yellow. <laughs> So that's me reacting so excitedly just to the idea of having a text colour in yellow. When you design a game, you want someone to open that menu and go, oh, I can have it in yellow. Surely you want that reaction. Because if you put that bit of effort in as a game designer, you're going to get it. I'm sure that we can all say that I know people that bought a PS4 to play The Last of Us 2. Blind gamers that had never thought of gaming before. That's your market. Have fun with designing accessibility, especially for low vision players, because you're gonna make someone squeal excitedly about the color yellow. And do it because it's fun. Enjoy making your game accessible and I will really, really enjoy playing it. So, uh, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's me done. You can find me at Twitch on the Blind Button Masher. And I think I've got some time for questions. Yes, definitely. Amy, that was absolutely uh, an amazing talk. And, and your reaction to The Last of Us is, is, is beautiful. And, and, I, and I love that. And, and don't think it, you're, it, it's not, we're not competing. <laughs> I think yours is just as beautiful as, as whatever mine was, but uh, uh, thank you, Amy, for, for that uh, talk. And actually, I, I, I would love what you basically, what you said, like you called the Rat King the humongous fungus. I'm going to yep. be calling uh, now for, for, from now on. Um, and even the, like, I love what you said, like you have such good alliteration. You said, um, uh, like, don't, uh, don't fix it, let us flick it. Like that to me, like for Amy's assist is absolutely amazing. Um, but I wanted to kind of ask you a few questions. And, uh, and one of the questions I was going to ask, and actually uh, Vivek even brought it up in the chat, was um, how do you, like, how do you think accessibility will look um, in regards to uh, next generation? We're going to be going into the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5. What are some of the things that you would love to be able to see for accessibility um, for us uh, blind players uh, uh, during next gen? 
well, I need to, you know, learn a bit more about it. I'm not a super expert. I'm quite curious about some of this haptic feedback and how we can start using that, um, because I know that that has a, a lot of potential um, for, for vision impaired players as well. Um, and having haptic feedback could really improve things like navigation, actually. If you've got a stronger vibration or a haptic feedback, the closer you are to an objective could be really interesting. Um, I really want to understand what PS5 are doing about the screen reader for navigating around the console, because in the UK, that's a big issue. We don't we don't get it. So um, I'm really curious to know more about that. I know Jamie's going to be talking about it a bit in a while, but I, I am worried about VR. I haven't tried it a lot. Um, and I just I hope that we don't get so sophisticated. They kind of corner us out of the market, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was one thing I even I think I heard that even with the new HD camera that PlayStation is going to be sending out, like you can't use it for uh, the PlayStation VR. So you kind of have to use the, the original camera that uh, uh, that it came with. So yeah, it'd be very interesting to see that. And I agree with you, the screen reader. So I actually, I'm not too familiar sort of how the screen reader works um, in the in the UK for the PlayStation. Does it just not work at all or is it just not available? No, it's not available. Oh, that's, oh, that's too bad. Yeah, I definitely would, I agree with you there. I would love to be able to see on the t uh, a screen reader, like being able to tap into games or at least have an API to, uh, to do that. Um, and of course, as you know, like our friend uh, uh, Cherry is in the, ch is in the chat as well. Um, hi, Cherry. Um, so uh, they asked actually, um, do you feel people uh, like, um, do people feel about high contrast, like, but with lack of atmosphere? So um, like we, so we, like we saw the high contrast in The Last of Us and then, and we kind of saw everything surrounding the kind of main colors of blue, yellow, and red. Um, but it kind of had a very muted sort of monochrome kind of environment around you. Um, how do you feel about that uh, as a low vision player? Would you want to be able to see more of the environment or do you like how the uh, sort of everything kind of went into like a black and white sort of setting? Well, actually, and you can, you can see the clip on my, on my Twitch, but there's a bit with the, the stalkers, you know, the, the crawly guys. Mm -hmm. And I put on the high contrast mode to be able to play better, but also, my goodness, it makes it a lot less scary, which actually at the time was quite good. Um, I, you know, I mean, I always say this, I just want as many kind of levels as possible, being able to toggle that. I think a little bit more, you know, I could have taken a little bit more detail, um, but one of the really powerful ways that they can they can get around that is think about your, your audio design, think about you know, the noises, maybe how you're interacting with a wet floor or an echoey room, you know, the distance of growls and snarls, all of that stuff we've done extremely well, in my opinion, in The Last of Us 2. So no, and you know what, like, like most of the world is kind of looks like that to me. So it doesn't really like, you know, it's like, oh. It didn't bother you as much, yeah, yeah. I totally it's like, oh, that. it looks like outside. Um, yeah, no, I think there's definitely some, some progress to be made, but uh, yeah, it's just a new exciting thing to develop and explore, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Um, and there was also like a bit of conversation happening in the chat as well about sort of um, the using sound for atmosphere. Uh, obviously, like I, I, for myself, we have like uh, basically a lot of sound uh, and that can help sort of add the immersion for, for me personally. Uh, and I think you've touched on it briefly, but uh, could you really expand on kind of like, how do you feel about um, sound being used in, in a way to be able to kind of bring you into the game more than just necessarily just the visuals? Oh, absolutely. So, and it doesn't have to be, I think sometimes people think it, we're just talking about audio cues here, which obviously The Last of Us 2 did very well and uh, Spider-Man with the BPBP beep beep did very well. But it's even things like, um, music changing like i don't know if other people notice this but there's like enemy music sometimes in games and that really helps give me a clue i'm like right guys something's gonna happen now and with the, and in, in tomb raider i don't know if you could pick it up but they have this almost like clang before mm -hmm. kind of the, the the enemies are gonna come in um but yeah I, i'm really i i you know we listen to video game soundtracks and and sometimes if i've got it just looping in the background and the, in the enemy music comes on i'm suddenly like oh crap is a wolf gonna come in my office <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i think it is really important and I, I i read a really interesting thread all about how they designed the clicker noises which i found fascinating mm -hmm. um, so yeah you've got to think about your audio design not just from a kind of functional accessibility perspective but really get into that atmosphere Sure. And uh, are there any other games that, uh, that you like that um, that has that the kind of really good sound atmosphere other than uh, Last of Us or, or Spider-Man? I think, I think Tomb Raider does it quite well. Mm -hmm. um, 
I definitely think that, say, the Uncharted series used not necessarily sound design, but used music in quite an interesting way. Yeah, to kind of give a different atmosphere or to give a different feel to an environment. Um, I would even, you know, get on Minecraft. It's like when you're down in that mine and suddenly you hear that zombie growl and you're like, oh, no, don't want to go through that wall. <laughs> it's like, I'm just going to avoid those. They're like, no, <laughs> <gonna be." laughs> like the little hiss of a creeper behind you. Like, ah! <laughs> oh, oh, every time that just gives me shivers. <laughs> um, so there's actually Earl in the, uh, in the chat had actually asked as well, kind of going back to sort of the high contrast uh, mode. So um, Earl's wondering, is, is yellow uh, like hugely desirable uh, overall for high contrast? For me, yes, I like yellow. I like, a, I like a yellow on dark. But the good thing is that people can need to be able to choose different options. So because I'm very light sensitive, Mm -hmm. um, it's easier for me to see a light text on a dark background. Now, obviously, visual impairments vary hugely from person to person. It is a kind of good standard, you know, a good high contrast between, you know, whether it's yellow on black or, or black on yellow, that does, you know, kind of as an accessibility standard, it, it meets the needs of a lot of people. But having those options is best. Right. A hundred, a hundred percent. Um, and also, uh, Cherry has another uh, question here that uh, I love to really hear your thoughts as well. Um, how would we best communicate things we think could be good for vision, but isn't an option for, uh, or setting, but part of the gameplay? Oh, that's an interesting thing. Um, so, and actually it's kind of, and I'm sure Steve might be able to come in on this, but it's kind of those, those hacks like uh, in Ghost, I saw on your, your video, you talked about the cinematic settings mm -hmm. and for the display, how that actually ended up being a bit of a hack for a slightly higher contrast in the palette. Um, and I think really, I would encourage uh, designers to really em embrace, you know, these are different hacks and kind of saying like, we've done this for a nice gameplay fun setting. However, X, Y, Z people might also find it useful. I think having that information in advance about a game, you know, saying, is it a really melee style game? Is it a shooter up? Is it, you know, a sneaky sneaky? For me, even having something like 40% of the missions in this game can be done stealth. That's gonna incline me more towards buying that game. It's about having that information and, um, Obviously we're here to talk about accessibility, but, and it's important to think about kind of that menu design as well, because I think if we put everything into an accessibility menu, other people don't discover that they're things that they like and need. So actually kind of putting some stuff all in together in a gameplay menu with perhaps a heading along the lines of, this may help low vision players, will make people think, oh, it's like an accessibility setting, but I also find it useful. Yeah, I 100% agree. Like in regards to like it uh, for features um, that are sort of designed, like not necessarily designed with accessibility in mind, but having that sort of foresight to be able uh, to basically say, okay, yeah, we designed this feature for this, but this can also help um, the, like these uh, these players as well um, is a huge benefit and at least gives us kind of the knowledge because I think probably a few people would have skipped by uh, Ghost of Tsushima because of uh, uh, they may not have uh, sort of known what the accessibility was in that and the in sort of the Kurosawa mode. It's kind Kind of like a, a it, it allows you to do like if you're colorblind to be able to play it without having to necessarily kind of uh worry about the color kind of getting in the way so um i i highly uh, agree with you on, on that one for sure I mean, um, the best solution is just to get you know pay me and steve to test your games yeah, <laughs> we'll tell you 100, like 100 <laughs> <laughs> percent developers you're watching please contact us <laughs> Um, there was actually a question uh, that I, uh, that actually I hadn't really played around with myself personally, but uh, I want to know if you had uh, if you had some thoughts on it. Uh, regards to uh, share play features on the uh, PS4, have you played with that at all? No, I haven't. No, so maybe that's something to look into. Yeah, and I'm also kind of wondering how that will sort of play in with the the PlayStation Five as well, because I know that a few people I've I've sort of seen that um, uh, that they've used SharePlay as kind of a way to get sort of sighted assistance, um, mm. and, and so that they can not necessarily have to sort of uh, be super close they can kind of like connect with people online without having to be in the same room for uh, for it. Um, but I'm I'm interested to kind of see like how that moves forward even for uh, for next gen as well. Yeah, I think the main thing that I would say is that, you know, I am not a super technical person, like honestly, like even getting my Twitch set up was one, like one hell of a battle, you know, because there are accessibility barriers in that as well. So 
I would say, you know, think about how simple you can make this stuff. Because say when I watch someone like Brendan do all this clever stuff with Discord and co-piloting and I just think, oh, Lord, that's a bit beyond me. Like, you know, that's really technical. Mm -hmm. I, I want something a bit simpler um, to be able to just bring someone else in for that experience. Um, and I think, you know, see it as a, as a bonus because people that if that person enjoys assisting you playing the game, they might go get it themselves, you know? Yeah. And that was actually kind of brings up like even a conversation I've had this week uh, with some people is that like us and ourselves like, we're in, in the accessibility community, we're essentially like really like high end power users uh, of a lot of the games and systems that we play. Um, but it's uh, it, it even kind of back to the, how to commun communicate uh, best. Like we have to sort of figure out, like kind of take a step back and sort of figure out how, okay, how do we communicate to that um, 12 year old who Get, becomes uh, disabled and uh, like and have to sort of figure out a way to be able to play video games. Like, how do you communicate that um, is going to be is going to be interesting um, moving forward. So I think as well, like when we're kind of using these features, uh, it'd be kind of cool to figure out a way to to discuss it and and, and just in, in its kind of generalized manner. So um, I mean, yeah, I would love to be able to kind of sort of see that. And there was actually it kind of going back to the sound um, question, the uh, discussion we were talking about. Um, there was a question that kind of came up of, uh, is binaural sound a good way of helping with spatial interaction? Yes, I think so. I mean, I, you then, again, this is another thing to think about, like, you know, what kind of setup does a person have? Does a person have super fancy speakers or are they just playing, you know, on their TV in their, in their sitting room? Um, I also like, um, and I don't know what, the, again, I don't know what the technical term is, but I quite like the, the controller speaker. It sometimes mm. adds a different kind of sound level and element. Um, but yeah, I think it can, you know, thinking about how, how and, and maybe having recommendations. So for example, if you're putting in a certain sound design that you think will give someone a bit more atmospheric and navigational cues with a headset, tell people to play with a headset on, you know? Yeah. Kind of yeah. And I'm also really excited to see what like 3D audio is going to be like. And mm, yeah. Um, that's going to be uh, interesting as well. Um, and so, okay, perfect. Well, Amy, thank you so much. There is also, actually, I should probably mention that there's definitely some appreciation in the chat for your baby Yoda. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Check out baby Yoda. <laughs> yeah. I'm jealous. I, I wish I had one myself. There's also um, a Borg and there's also Lara. Oh, wow. Well, that's cool. Oh, my gosh. I'm jealous. Uh, 100%. Uh, so, Amy, where can we be able to uh, find you uh, online and, and follow up what, you, what you're doing? So you can find me on Twitter. I basically live on Twitter. You can find me at Blonde Historian, Blonde with an E. And then you can find me on Twitch. I am Blind Button Masher on Twitch. Perfect. And I'm currently doing some fundraising on Twitch. So, you know, if you feel nice and you enjoyed the talk, you can do a little, you can come and hang out and donate to my disability fundraiser for, awesome. uh, for young people with complex disabilities. Fantastic. Well, definitely people go donate. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Amy. Uh, your talk was absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, we'll definitely uh, chat online. Okay. Thank you very much. Of course. Thank you.